Hi guys, Mr. Mazurkowitz here, and in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about properties of water and what properties of water make it so essential for life. So when I ask students why is water so important for life, I often get answers like, well, we need it, and without water, we'll become dehydrated and die, or plants need it because they need it to grow. Uh, but when I ask them why, what makes water so special and not something else, they the conversation tends to stop there. So in this picture here, we have a picture of planet Earth, our home, and next to it is a planet known as Kepler-186f, and this was discovered by NASA's Kepler uh, telescope. It's light years away, but why we're so interested in this planet is because it is located in what's called the habitable zone of its uh, sun, or its star. Uh, what that means is that we expect to find liquid water uh, on that planet. It's not too far, but it's not too close, and we hope to find liquid water. So why is it that we're so interested in liquid water on planets? Why do we, when we send this Curiosity rover to Mars, we're on the hunt for liquid water? And Well, it's because water is what we would say essential for life. Where we expect to find water, we expect to find life. So today's lesson essential questions, we have two of them. One is, what are the properties of water that make it essential for life? Uh, you should be able to at least name the several different properties that, that water has. And then also a bit of a higher question is, how does water's polarity, and this is a word we're going to cover in this podcast, but how does water's polarity relate to its importance and sustainability of life? So we're going to get to those topics, and hopefully you can answer both of these questions by the end. If we start with by taking a look at a water molecule, H2O, we'll notice that it uh, looks like Mickey Mouse and it has two hydrogens for those ears and then the head is one of those oxygens, so again H2O. And these hydrogens are connected through what's called a covalent bond. In other words, they share electrons and that's what bonds them together. If you're not really sure about bonding or covalent bonds, that's okay. What you really need to understand here is that oxygen, because it's bigger, it's also a, what we call more electronegative. There is a higher affinity or higher attraction of electrons on this side of the molecule. So oxygen is going to take more of these negatively charged electrons, therefore hydrogen is going to have less of those electrons near it, and we end up with an unequal distribution of charge. So our oxygen is going to end up more negatively charged because those negative electrons are closer to this side, therefore the hydrogens are going to be positively charged. So because one side is positive while the other side is negative, we get this term. Here's that term I just introduced before, polarity. And all that polarity is, again, is when we have an unequal distribution of charge. Negative on one side, positive on the other. And it's really this polarity that's going to drive all these other properties of water that we talk about from here on out. So if we take two magnets and we were to place them together and we take the same side, so here are the white tips of this magnet held to the white tips of this one, where they're the same charge on those, you might have tried this before and when you do that you get this repelling force. They kind of push away from each other and that's because same charges push each other away or repel. But if I take one of those magnets and flip it around uh, and I put the opposite ends towards each other, I get what is called an attraction. They uh, stick together. So what does this have to do with water? Well, the same sort of thing happens with water molecules. Remember that water is polar, so there's a positive and negative side to it. So with these four water molecules, I actually get an attraction between the positive hydrogens, these white parts, to the negative oxygen, the red parts. These bonds have a certain name to them. So the bond between hydrogen to oxygen have what is called a hydrogen bond. So here's a picture of a bunch of water molecules and we'll see that the bond between the positive hydrogen and the negative uh, oxygen is called a hydrogen bond. So to write this down, bonds formed between the negative oxygen and positive hydrogen of different water molecules, we call those hydrogen bonds. So again, uh, the polarity is the positive and negative side of a water molecule, and the bond between or the attraction between those positive and negative charges are called hydrogen bonds. And we'll revisit those uh, for a few times here on out. So when we take water and uh, we have a bunch of water here at the bottom left, we have an astronaut in outer space. You can see that without gravity pulling it down, water has this ability to attract other water droplets or other water molecules. What we call this force is cohesion. So those hydrogen bonds that we're just talking about really is cohesion. What cohesion can be defined as is the attraction between molecules of the same substance. In this case, water is attracted to other water molecules. Uh, you might have seen this in my class. We do drops on a penny where we fit as many drops as we can onto one side of a penny. Many students think I can fit maybe 8 or 10 or 12, but what they end up getting is some kit into the 80s. Uh, they can fit so many and we get this dome shape on top of the penny. It's because all the water molecules are attracted and holding on to each other. If we take a look at this picture of an insect standing on top of the water, we notice that he doesn't fall right through. It actually acts as a barrier or like a trampoline that he's able to actually stand on. And that's because of those hydrogen bonds again are holding 
still, and they keep the uh, insect from falling through, and it can actually uh, withstand its weight. But if I were to take that and disturb the uh, water, the surface, the insect would fall through. We do a similar thing with paper clips. You can actually take a paper clip, which is more dense and should sink, but if I lightly place it on the top, that cohesion or the hydrogen bonds can support the weight. Another force that's very similar to cohesion is adhesion. And what that is is the attraction of water to other surfaces or other molecules. So looking at this picture of these pine leaves, uh, you can actually see that water is clinging on. Or if you ever get out of the shower, you notice that water doesn't fall right off, it clings on. And that's because of a very similar thing that the positive and negative charges on water are attracted to the positive and negative charges of the molecules uh, to whatever it's sticking to. So adhesion can be defined as the attraction between molecules of different substances. So cohesion was water to water, adhesion is water to everything else that has a charge. So what is cohesion, what is adhesion, why is this so important, why are we even talking about this? Well if we take a look at these tubes here in the bottom left, we notice that water has the ability, this great ability to climb up against gravity. So here in this middle tube uh, is placed in water, we notice that the water level actually rises in that tube. And it's not because it's being pumped, but actually water is climbing up the inside of that tube. There's adhesion, the water is attracted to the inside of the tube, so it's sticking to the surface of the tube, and also pulling up with it other water molecules because of the cohesion. And we notice as we get these tubes skinnier and skinnier, it can rise higher and higher because there's less force pulling it down. So the skinnier the tube, the higher it can rise against gravity. Well, what does this have to do with life? Well, here we have a tree, a California redwood tree. These trees can get as tall as over 300 feet. Well, how do they get all the water from their roots underneath the ground up to the leaves at the top? Well, it's thanks to this force called capillary action, this ability for water to be attracted to the inside of the xylem, this tube on the inside, or tu tubes, excuse me, on the inside of the trunk of the tree, and climb up to the very top. Without capillary action, without cohesion, without adhesion, plants would have a very, very hard time getting water from their roots to their leaves, and we might not see uh, as much oxygen and as much life on this planet. Another property of water that uh, is very, very interesting is that it expands upon freezing. Or in other words, when water freezes or becomes solid, it becomes uh, bigger, it expands, but more importantly, it becomes less dense. Most things, if you remember from another science class you've taken, Solids tend to be more dense than their liquid counterparts, but water does the opposite. When it freezes and becomes solid, the density actually decreases. Well, why is this? If we take a look at the molecules of water here, here is a uh, cartoon picture of water molecules that are frozen. Recall back that we have these hydrogen bonds that connect them together. Well, what those hydrogen bonds do for my water molecules is it causes them to spread out more. It locks them into what's called a lattice structure, L-A-T-T-I-C-E. But this lattice is just this beautiful pattern that we see where the molecules spread themselves out. Therefore, we have a lot more air in between these water molecules. More air, more space means less density. So when water freezes, it actually floats. Why is this important for life? Well, if we take a look back at this picture here with this iceberg, or just sheets of ice, when water freezes and it floats on the top, it actually insulates the water that's underneath. If it did the opposite, if it sank, water would freeze and sink, and then freeze and sink, and eventually we'd get an entire body of water that's frozen completely shut from top to bottom. But thankfully, water uh, floats at the top, or the ice floats at the top, therefore it protects the water underneath, and that's great for the ecosystems that might live there. Another property of water is that it has what's called a high specific heat capacity. So if you recall from any other classes you might have taken, if you know anything about heat and molecules, what are the atoms doing inside uh, when things heat up? They start to move faster and faster. There's more kinetic energy. Well, again, let's remember that water molecules are held together by those hydrogen bonds. So when we add heat to it, when we heat up water, those hydrogen bonds keep them from moving around so much. So what we end up with is what's called high specific heat or high heat capacity, which just is another way of saying that water has this ability to absorb a lot of heat, but its temperature stays pretty moderate. It doesn't fluctuate too much. So it doesn't get hot too quick, and it also doesn't cool down because those hydrogen bonds uh, store the energy and they don't allow those molecules to move around so much. Again, why is this important for life? Well, let's take a look at, let's say, the ecosystem in the desert. Uh, if you know anything about deserts, they tend to get very, very hot during the daytime, so the temperature shoots up when that sun rises because there's no water to absorb it, so the ground heats up. But then what happens when the sun sets? Well, there's no water to store that energy, so the temperature plummets. Uh, this causes the temperatures to fluctuate drastically. If we go to an ecosystem like an ocean, well, those oceans don't change too much. They get a little bit warmer and a little bit colder, and we want that. We don't want our environments to fluctuate too drastically.
Also in humans, what do we do when we get too hot? Well, we will sweat. So you see this athlete here is sweating a lot. He's using water's high specific heat capacity to absorb a lot of that heat energy, take away that heat, and then evaporate, but still make him uh, feel cool. Uh, if it was to heat up too quick, that would not be comfortable, would not help cool him down. The last property of water we're going to talk about here is that water is what we call the universal solvent. And a solvent is anything that can dissolve other substances. So in this case, you might know that water is an excellent solvent. We call it the universal solvent because it can dissolve a bunch of different things. So here we have a picture of salt, sodium chloride, Na and Cl. And if you take a look at a sodium chloride molecule, you'll notice that the sodium, the Na, is positively charged and the chlorine, the Cl, is negatively charged and that's what's bonding them together. Well, what happens when I take sodium chloride or salt and place it with a bunch of water molecules? Well, again, remember, water is polar. It has a negative oxygen, positive hydrogens. So those negative oxygens are going to be attracted to the positive sodium. The positive hydrogens are going to be attracted to the negative chlorine, and it'll actually pull it apart. That is great because we need to break things down into smaller uh, substances. Without the ability of water to dissolve things, they would just kind of settle at the bottom of the oceans. Our bodies are filled mostly with water. This makes it great so we can break down not just salt, but other nutrients and transport them around. If we were to take away that water, why is it that salt recrystallizes? Well, get that water away and the sodium chloride comes back together and that's when you see the uh, salt crystallize again. But again, water is able to dissolve so many different things like salt because of its polarity. It can be attracted to the positive and negative ends and just rip those uh, molecules apart. So that's it for the properties of water. Uh, hopefully you're able to answer these less than essential questions. So by now you should be able to tell me what are the properties of water that make it essential for life. We just went through them. And also how does polarity relate to all those properties? How does water's polarity, the positive side and the negative side of it, relate to its importance and sustainability of life? All right, so if you guys can do that, you're great. If not, you might want to go back and rewatch it. That's it. I hope you guys learned something and I will see you soon.